Happy Friday. Welcome to another episode of Brain Scratch. I'm John Lorden. Thank you so much for spending some time with us here today and looking into a situation where a family desperately needs some help. As a matter of fact, for today's case, I can't find one news article about it. That's how little coverage is going on. Just a little bit over a year ago, Lucas Pyle was tragically killed in Detroit. His family's looking for justice, questioning, is law enforcement doing enough? How am I going to tell this story without any articles? With their help. So first, we're going to go over some information that I found online just about what's going on in Detroit at this time, uh, a little bit of social information around Lucas, and then we will bring on his family to help us understand more. But let's go ahead and get started over at DetroitNews.com. Detroit remains among the nation's most violent big cities, according to FBI statistics. Detroit in 2020 had a rate of 2,248 violent crimes per 100,000 residents. It's behind only Memphis, Tennessee as the highest rate in the country among cities with more than 100,000 residents. Uh, they've got the breakdown here on the screen. I'll just leave that up for a second so you can take a look at it. In 2020, 14,370 violent crimes, which include assault, robbery, rape, and criminal homicide, were reported by Detroit police. According to that FBI data, that's a 10.25% increase from 2019. Homicides nationally jumped 29.4% from 2019 to 2020. You might have heard us talk about this before. A lot of people have been pointing out that statistic, wondering what's going on. Is this some type of COVID effect of you know people being cooped up? Um, but yeah, big jumps in homicides nationally. In Detroit specifically, murders rose 19.3%. So not quite as high as the national average, but when you're already one, an area like this that's already struggling in this way, any type of increase is, is a tough thing to deal with. Detroit Police Chief James White pointed out that while nationally homicides jumped about 30% last year over 2019, Detroit's increase was 19%, making it, quote, on the low end of the uptick compared to other major cities, which saw higher increases. That's a testament to the hard work of the men and women of the police department, but we're not celebrating, he said. We're still averaging getting 500 guns off the street a month, and the kind of impulsive violence we've seen over the last two years is the worst I've ever seen. I don't know if it's COVID or a sense of hopelessness, but this is happening everywhere. Uh, it is happening everywhere. As a matter of fact, just uh, last week in at a location in St. Paul, uh, there was an area I I like to go to actually on uh, 7th Street close to the Excel Energy Center. And it's a place called the Truck Park. And essentially, it's kind of this large bar area that you walk inside and they've got what looks like trucks. Like, you know, you would go to a... Um, go to an event somewhere and they'd have a bunch of food trucks or something like that. But they're they're just shells of trucks that are set up inside this interior area to look like that kind of thing. And each truck serves a different type of food. It's also got a very big bar. And being so close to Excel, uh, there's a lot of big events that happen there. I pull a lot of people downtown and uh, people go to 7th Avenue Truck Park. Um, there was a shooting there. Apparently, there was a disagreement that happened between two men. They both pulled weapons. Uh, last count, I think I saw, was 16 people that were harmed. Uh, we're talking people that received gunshots directly or fragments of bullets that had entered them. There was one fatality. Uh, of course, there was footage of everything that was going on. Uh, they've got a lot of cameras down in that area as well. So uh, two, the two men are in custody at this point. But just kind of highlighting, this, this type of violence seems to be erupting. And I can tell you socially, just among people that live close to that area, when we're talking about this, we're all asking the same question of like, okay, so you've got a problem with some guy in a bar. What takes it to the level of pulling out guns and shooting like what happened to hey let's step outside and talk this out or let's even slug this out there are so many different levels but it things like it seems like things are escalating very sharply and very quickly 
And is that possibly what happened in today's case as well, I think is a, a consideration we certainly have to keep in mind. This is a picture of Lucas Robert Pyle. Let's learn a little bit about Lucas Pyle, unfortunately from his obituary. Lucas Robert Pyle was born on May 12, 1986 and left this earth tragically on October 15, 2020. He is survived by his loving wife, Megan, and children two very young girls, Marley Rose and Macy Ann, also lovingly remembered by his family. And he had a bit of an extended, blended family, uh, his mother and stepfather, his father and his father's new fiance. But on top of that, uh, beloved brothers, including Matthew Pyle, who will be on the show with us later, um, multiple aunts, uncles, nieces, nephews, just a big family that is affected by this. But I know the thing that's certainly grabbing at my heart uh, is thinking about Marley and Macy and what were they going through last week on October 15th, thinking about a year ago, we lost our, our father. How are they dealing with that? How are they coping with that? I'm, I'm hoping that we can learn a little bit more about that later. Um, just taking a look at Lucas's Facebook, uh, I got to tell you, it's just... It's a ton of pictures of a father seemingly loving on his family. His his kids are just all over his Facebook from from top to bottom. Uh, there is also a GoFundMe, and we're going to lean on this just because we need some details in terms of what's happening with this case. Um, but let's go ahead and read what his brother Matthew wrote here. My brother Lucas Pyle tragically passed before his time due to a sense a needless and senseless homicide. He was a husband, a father, a brother, and a friend to so many. This tragic and untimely passing has left his two daughters both without a father and without substantial resources in which to adequately provide a life that is deserved by these two beautiful children. I'm currently trying to raise money in order to be able to provide these girls with a life they are so deserving of. And Matthew Pyle is a man serving in our armed forces currently stationed in Germany, which I'm sure is not easy on him as well in terms of trying to deal with all this and to make sure these two little girls are being cared for. All monies collected will be put directly into a trust in which I'm setting up for his little girls. Where did this happen? Um, this is the address, 19420 Conant Street in Detroit, Michigan. If we get down to street level, something kind of unique. I don't know that I've had this happen on a case before. But this is kind of a newer street scan that happened in August of 2021. And here you might notice a little sign on the side of the road. It's actually a sign about Lucas Pyle and searching for information, asking people to call in if they have any information about what happened in this parking lot uh, just over a year ago. So it's the parking lot to an auto repair center. I don't know if that ties into the case in any way. We'll be asking during the interview about all those details. We've got a car wash across the street. Um, and outside of that, it's just a neighborhood. We got houses. We've got a church. This happened on a Thursday at 5.30 in the afternoon. There's got to be some witnesses. There's got to be someone out there that has information. And if you're that person and you're sitting there and you're not sure... If you can do this, please, please find it within your heart. We've got the contact information you need in the description box down below, not only for the police department, but if you need to remain anonymous, we can do that. Crime Stoppers is actively involved with this case as well. They keep it anonymous. You call in, they won't basically take your name. They will give you a number. And if you see the case is solved, you call back with that number. They arrange for a payment somewhere. From what I hear, in, the, in this particular instance, they pay cash. There's just no transactional information to connect you back to that tip at all. So um, if you're out there worried about it, how do I get this information in? Please do that. Outside of that, if, if you need to talk for some reason, you think you have the information, but you're just not sure you can even call Crime Stoppers, please send me an email at john at lordnarts.com. Um, we have been pretty fortunate that people that have reached out in the past have found it within their hearts to actually do the right thing and take that next step. And if there's anything I could do to help you feel more comfortable about that, please, please reach out to me. Um, now, what are the details of this? Let's hear it from Lucas's ex-wife directly. From what we know, the suspects were in an older gold Camry with a missing hubcap. 
The driver, who was also the shooter, is a taller black male, and the accomplice is a white male. As far as we know, they shot Lucas inside of that vehicle, and he jumped out, and they ran him down and proceeded to shoot him. Nobody deserves to die that way, especially Lucas. He was funny and intelligent. He was street smart and very charismatic. He was a good person. And at one point in time, he was my person. Very special to think of Megan stepping up and doing this for her children, but also for herself. You could tell there's still a lot of love there. Uh, and I don't know if you guys caught it, but here on the right side of the screen, these two heartbroken children's faces are Lucas's daughters. So we need to help them. And I want to also thank Crime Stoppers for putting this video out. It's one of the best videos that I've seen in terms of concise information, how you can help. Uh, there is a $2,500 reward that they've talked about at the end of this video as well. Unfortunately, this video has only been viewed 282 times. In a case where I can't find any news coverage on it, to have such a good piece of information out there and no one looking at it is really breaking my heart as well. So we need your guys' help. Please share this video with any friends or family that you have in the Detroit area. We've got to open up some hearts to this case. We need the person that has the right information to call it in. Uh, we can't do that if they don't know about it. So I need your help to raise exposure to this. And I think at that point, it's time to bring on our guests. And joining us on the show now, we are very honored and privileged to be joined by Lucas's brother, Matthew, and his ex-wife, Megan. Uh, thank you both so much for joining us here and to helping to shed some light on this. This is honestly, in terms of the cases I've looked into, uh, the toughest one because there's no <laughs> public information outside of that Crime Stoppers video. And uh, Megan, before you joined on the call, Matthew and I were just talking about how amazing it was for you to do the speech that you did at the location and get all those details out. So um, thank you both thank for you. being here. Yeah. So no I want I wanted to start by kind of learning about Lucas. That's another thing. Without all this press, we don't really know much about him. So uh, what did what did Lucas do for work? I mean, he really wasn't working before he died, um, but he was always a hard worker. When I was pregnant with Marley, when we were both in high school, he was working three jobs. Um, you know, he he was a hard worker no matter what he was doing, um, but he really didn't have a job towards the end. Yeah, I did see, like I saw uh, a picture of him, you know, talking about a new job and he was putting on a suit and he's like, this is the first time I've had to wear a suit for a job. Or I saw, I think a UPS certification was another thing that it kind of happened yeah. at some point. Yeah. Yeah. And that was when we uh, first moved to Michigan um, and he was wearing that suit because he got uh, a job in a nightclub. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Uh, what were some of his favorite hobbies and activities? What did he like to do? Well, he liked to cook. He liked to drive around. Just, you know. Yeah. How about, how about growing he up? Wanted to, he wanted to do whatever he wanted to do whenever he wanted to do it. That's how he rolled. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'd, I'd say that's pretty accurate of Lucas and and myself. We, Him and I growing up pretty, pretty much inseparable. Um, our older brother's five years older than me. So it was him and I, um, we played baseball together. We hung out down at the Crick, uh, down the road from our house. We had a neighborhood full of kids. So we were always out doing things. Um, no matter what it was essentially growing up, it was Lucas and I. So, yeah. Yeah. And did I see, right. Were you guys from New York? Central New York. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Um, what do you guys, and we'll, we'll start with you, Matthew. Uh, what do you miss most about Lucas? I guess random uh, phone calls. Just, yeah. Checking in on his brother. Yeah. Yeah. Just saying what's up and seeing what's going on. Uh, the random times where, we'd both be in the same area 
because I haven't lived anywhere around there for a long time. So we always seem to be in the same area at the same time. So we hung out a lot, whether whether it was at the local watering hole <laughs> when we got older or um, playing golf, doing just whatever. I mean, there there weren't many times where we weren't together when he was around. Yeah, yeah. How about it, Megan? Uh, what do you miss most? And I know this might be a little complicated. I mean, this you guys were separated effectively, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, honestly, now I miss him, his voice the most, and him blowing up my phone. I mean, it was a. <laughs> You know, he would disappear for a while and then it would be months and or weeks and months and of nonstop calls, you know, and sending me pictures of himself. This is where I'm at. You know, this is what I'm doing. I know you want to know, <laughs> you know, that's what I miss the most. What Was there something about his lifestyle that was taking him away for these periods of time? I know there's even a gap right before his death of him kind of being out of contact. I mean, he liked a certain lifestyle that it didn't have anything to do really with drugs or anything. It just like, um, just like, like I said before, he just liked to really do his own thing. And it kind of, he kind of got caught up in the living situation that he was in, in Detroit. I lived about 30 minutes away from him. So when he was out there, he was really on his own. Um, and you know, there were times where I couldn't have him in my life or my kid's life. And, you know, I think he knew that and understood that. And yeah, yeah, just the way it was always. He definitely knew we him and I had many of conversations about things along those lines. Yeah, um, it gets tough. You know, I mean, I've I, I went through a divorce and I know um, put myself in a bunch of not the best social circles and uh, tough situations while you're dealing with all those emotions and all that kind of stuff. So I know it's, it's not an easy thing to go through. Um, I, I saw that uh, there was a mention and I, I just want to make sure this is the right Lucas. I found some old article from like 2009 about the Craigslist killer, Philip Markoff. <laughs> was, was Lucas quoted in that? He was. Yeah. Yeah. So, they went to high uh, school together. Wow. Yeah. wow. Philip, Philip Markoff was, uh, he was two years younger than me. They were in the same grade together. They played baseball together growing up. So yeah, we, he, he grew up down the road from us. Wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's so crazy. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's the only thing I, I kind of was like, when I was looking for information, it looked like a crime article and it was coming up with Lucas. And I'm like, Oh good. Someone did write about this case. And then I went and started reading it. I'm like, this isn't about him at all, but he's quoted in it. But mm -hmm. um, yeah. So uh, Megan, when did, when did you guys get married and when, when did it end? How was. Uh, we got married in 2007. Um, and then our, we got divorced in 2017. Okay. But we've been together. We were together for 13 years. We were together when we were 16. Gotcha. Gotcha. And in that marriage, of course, um, two adorable girls from at least from what I can see in terms of, of pictures. And I also kind of pointed out to the audience, we ran a little clip from the speech that you gave at the location. And that that is your daughter's over to your left, I guess. Yes. Um, and it, it was very clear how how heartbroken they were. Uh, I imagine a week ago was really tough on them with it being October 15th. I mean, we actually found a spot to bury him. So I, for the most part, it was a good day. Just having him there in the cemetery, you know, it wasn't what I thought it was going to be. Um, honestly. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? What? I mean... Of course, it was sad at first, but then once you get over that, he's resting in a in a place, you know, he's okay. Yeah. You know, and the girls know that his mom knows that, you know, he's he's sorry. Mm -hmm. um, 
he's better off or not better off, of course not, but just in a better place than yeah. Detroit. Yeah. Not suffering. And yeah. Um, th- was there a loss that he went through in 2018? I saw on some of his social media, it looked like someone he was referring to that was named angel. It seems like. Yes. Angel. Uh, she was his girlfriend. Okay. Um, and she was on drugs, but he had worked with her. He actually got her clean. He got her off of heroin, heroin, like, you know, Lucas smoked pot, but you know, drugs was not his thing. Yeah. So, you know, he got her off of that and she was off of it for a while for a good chunk and she was doing good. And, you know, I think he knew something was not right with her. Um, cause he did tell you, you know, he said, she thinks I don't know, but I do. And yeah, he actually, he found her when she, when she died. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. It's terrible. Yeah. Uh, heroin, man. I mean, just busting up lives and families. Uh, that's, that's a really tough thing to, to deal with. And especially, you know, trying to get her on, on a good track and it looked like good progress happening there, mm-hmm. but I could just, I could really see in his posts, it hit him very, very hard. Um, yeah, it really did. Yeah. So talking about his case, uh, I asked, it was the first thing I talked to Matthew about when he got on the call, what is going on with the media coverage on this case? Why is there so little? So from the, from what I've seen and from what I've looked at since I've been over here, I don't see anything happening anywhere. Um, there was, I never found any articles about him in the numerous times that I, that I looked it up shortly after his death and trying to find out information. Um, there, there was just nothing. I don't know if it's due to the local crime rate and whatnot in that general vicinity, but there, it's just not there. Yeah, we did touch on that a little bit at the start of the video. We looked into crime stats for the area and, you know, Detroit is like number two in the country for uh, areas of over 100,000 people to, you know, have bad violence problems. What do you think, Megan? What's going on with this? I definitely think that it is because the crime rate, if Lucas had been killed on the west side, that police chief has an amazing record. You know, he gets um, cases solved. On the east side where Lucas was, it's like double the amount of deaths. Like Lucas wasn't the only person shot in that in that hour around the block. You know, there were two other people that were killed that day around that time. So I think they are short staffed and they don't speak to one another. They don't go out and try to do anything, you know, from what I can see, they had somebody in custody. They let him go because of COVID. And that's why he was released from prison to begin with was from COVID, like for COVID. He he was like a serving like an 11 year sentence and they let him out. Are you in touch with the detectives? Oh, uh, you can try to be. I've tried to be. Um, it went. I think I went four months without hearing from the first detective and I was leaving messages, you know, texting. And so finally on Lucas's, what would have been Lucas's 35th birthday, I texted him and I left him a message and I think he could hear it in my voice. Like, you know, this would have been Lucas's 35th birthday. What is going on? What, you know, we deserve to know. Like they didn't even reach out to Lucas's mom, which is just not cool. And they still haven't. The new detective hasn't. And you know, I've been hung up on, they've hung up on me. That's how Detroit PD rolls. You know, I just understaffed and they just really don't care. Mm. How about you, Matthew? They're, Any contact with them? So right at the beginning, the the day that we got the phone call, I was in touch with the lead detective, um, essentially from that point forward for a little while, because I didn't want anything on my mother's shoulders. Um, and they had nothing. And, uh, when I went to go pick Lucas up from Detroit, they wanted me to come to the station to answer questions. Like I was the bad guy. 
And I was like, I, I have no need to come see you guys at Detroit PD. Like you're, what have you done for the case? Who have you talked to? What, what leads do you have? And the entire time it was nothing, nothing, nothing. Um, and after I moved, I, I didn't contact uh, Detroit PD anymore for a long time until I got the new detectives information and I reached out to him and, and it, it just hasn't, there has been no consistent, no consistency within their formation to get any information. Uh, the flow of information about how Lucas died between the de detective and when I talked to the coroner's office, um, the methodology of his death and, and everything else, there was just discrepancies between the police and, and what the coroner said. And then the coroner's report was completely off off the grid in comparison to, to what I actually happened. Well, let's let's break this down a little bit. Um, so I know the description that happened in the video from Crime Stoppers is uh, first shot with him in the car. He gets out of the car. Uh, the car hits him and then more shots. Is that still accurate? What's where, where are the changes? Where are the discrepancies that you're finding in the documentation and what they're telling you? So, um. Like for instance, his the the medical examiner's report. The eyewitness said that they ran him over, and his leg got caught up in the tire. In his in the report, it just says that he has like small injury, a scratch, as like a scratch to his last two toes, and a little bit of scratches on his back, on his top back, and his lower back. But the eyewitness said like. Lucas's foot and leg got caught up in the tire and he went all the way around mm. and then they, you know, drove over him basically. Um, so there's like, it doesn't say anything about damage to his leg, to his foot, besides those two last toes. Um, that's what I, and like personal things that they got wrong. Okay. You know, okay. That they shouldn't have. Uh, Matthew, did you find any other discrepancies outside of that? Just like Megan said, the personal discrepancies between Lucas and what was actually in the report. Um, I mean, I got more information from the coroner when I was trying to find out information than than I was than I was getting from uh, DPD. Gotcha. Like I knew the methodology of, of death and everything else well before anybody else in the family. Um, I obviously kept that to myself for, for reasons not to upset, upset my mother with it or anybody else. Yeah. Um, but looking at the report after knowing the methodology of his death, it was just, it wasn't as consistent as it should have been. Okay. Um, are you able to clarify that or do you still want to keep that information private? The personal discrepancies? Well, no, the main thing I'm wondering is, was it the gunshots that killed him? Was it some aspect of being hit by the car? Like what was the actual cause? The, it, the actual cause of death does say that it was due to the gunshots. It doesn't say anywhere that he was run over or like uh, show, you know, maybe I just like going off TV when I was, when I was expecting the report and when I got it, it was just, you know, words. This is the, you know, I was like, maybe it's like, I'm wrong or naive to think that that's what it was going to be, but I was expecting like a body. And for him to have X here is where this was and X here and injuries to small toes. And I was expecting to see it all, but from things that were, you know, sent to me, I don't think that they even tried to help Lucas. Honestly, once they got there, they saw that he was shot and that that was it. And they didn't even try to help him or anything. 
Now, you mentioned at some point uh, that someone was detained for a while and that they had been released from jail for COVID. Is this someone in relation to Lucas's case that they thought was involved? Yes. And they just let this person go. And what have you asked them about follow up on that? Have they told you this person's been cleared? So, no, no, he hasn't no. been. Um, he absconded. Uh, so they had him and he was trying to he said, well, what can I what what can you do for me? He was trying to basically make a deal and he wasn't talking so they could only hold him for so long and it was warren police that had him in custody really because detroit police like to clarify this and not mince words that detroit didn't have him in custody warren warren county did him. yeah so they could only hold him for however long but the detective did tell me that they were keeping his cell phone and that he had been calling, calling nonstop, trying to get his phone because he needed to get his unemployment. He needed to do his unemployment. He needed his phone to do it. Um, and so like a week went by and I was checking the, the what is it, Matthew? Uh, the inmate website. Yeah, yeah. Website. The, the, I learned that he absconded. He absconded from parole. He's supposed to check in with his parole officer every week or what what have you. And he absconded. So I called, you know, the detective and I said, did you know that he's gone? And he goes, you mean he said the guy's name? And I'm like, yes, him. I'm like, go take a look at the website. He hasn't shown up for parole. Come to find out. He he just left. He's nowhere to be found anymore. So they had him. They let him go. Yep. They kept his phone. Wouldn't give it back to him. So that, that honestly, that that is the last that I heard from a police officer, a detective or anything. Um, so. So do you think that, um, is this person one of the two suspects that you described in the video? Yes. It is, okay. Did you know this person? So, anyway. I did not know him. I saw him the, so before Lucas was killed, I went and picked him up in Detroit about two and a half, three weeks before and he Lucas was like grabbing his stuff and bringing all his stuff out of this hotel room and putting it in my trunk. And so I just got out of the car and I was just like, do you need help? You know, and I wanted these people to see me just because like he has a life. He has a family. I, I wanted them to see me. Yeah. And honestly, the the girl that was in the hotel didn't come out, didn't. But the guy in, you know, the guy was standing inside, like right in, in the doorway kind of, and just like looking at Lucas and looking at me just dead. He looked, he had dead eyes. Like there was nothing, nothing there whatsoever. This sounds and, like you were trying to rescue Lucas from a situation. Was that kind of what was going on around this? I mean, I don't want to say rescue. I, Ish. I wanted, to, I always wanted to help him Yeah, always. And if I could, I, you know, I wanted to, and I did for the most part. Yeah. Is that the last time you saw him? He came, yeah, I picked him up and he came and stayed at the house for, I think three days. Um, and he had, I don't, I, he had gotten a phone call and it was from the girl's baby's father and he said okay you know i'm coming back to town talking about going back to detroit he's like i'll be there in a little while honestly it kind of was like a fight to get lucas to leave once he was at the house you know he didn't want to leave so it was like he was like okay yeah i'm coming i'll be back around in a, in a couple hours and it was it was the easiest he left and it was a good which is crazy it was like a Normally when he would leave, the girls were upset or I was upset or he was upset, you know, so it, it, the last time, that was the last time. And, um, it was actually really good. Okay. And the girl in the hotel room that you mentioned, this, is this someone that he was romantically involved with? I mean, when I think they definitely hooked up Okay. A couple, more than a couple of times. I don't know. Okay. Gotcha. Do we know why he was in that parking lot? Well, they were driving down the road. So 
they were driving and he was shot and they, he jumped out and the guy kind of stopped on his, and there was a car behind him and he almost got hit by that car, but he didn't. And he just ran just, and then he, he ran until he got hit. He couldn't mm. anymore. Okay. Okay. So the location has nothing to do with it. Really. They no. were just driving down the street. Okay. They, were, they were driving down the road. I and... mean, that street, that area is kind of where he hung out. Yeah. Okay. But not more than like to hang out and hang out for the night or anything like that. Now you've mentioned there's, there's a witness, there's an eyewitness to him um, being hit by the car. Is there anything else that that witness saw that has been relayed to you? Well, that's the only reason why I knew he really was run over, you know, and that his foot and his leg got caught up is because of what that man said. And he was also like, the car pulled up over here in front of this woman's house and she has a camera and the police never even talked to her and they still haven't talked to that woman. And now it's been a year. So whatever footage that she did have, like, cause the guy, the eyewitness was like, he parked right in front of her house, got out nonchalantly, walked over to Lucas, shot him a couple more times and walked back to the car. And the car was parked in front of the woman's house that has, you know, a camera. And the police never talked to her. They talked to the eyewitness one time, and that was it. Matthew, have you ever asked them about that? I mean, that's I, that's like a big miss, man. Absolutely. Um, I asked the first detective that was on his case when he was going to talk to these witnesses. He said he was he was getting to it. He was getting to it. Every time I talked to him, he was he was getting to it. Um, a few weeks ago, I spoke to the second detective and I asked him what he's done. And he said, well, we're still working on it. And I, I kind of called him out um, on on those words. And I, I mean, there there's just been no progress. There's when you can't talk to the people in the neighborhood about what happened, there's an issue. Like, yeah. Yeah. If if you haven't brought in. Like you have a witness that was in the vehicle that had to slam on his brakes. So he didn't run over Lucas. Right. That saw the person that walked up and shot Lucas. And they made eye contact. Yeah. Like then you, you haven't brought him in and been like, these are the people that are in this area. And Oh, by the way, we can pull video from the, um, the parking lot. And I'm sure these people have been in the area more than one time. Um, can you identify anybody? Do you think it's this guy? Do you think it's that guy um, from some of these videos based off your initial description? But I don't see anything happening. There's there's no follow up. There's no like that's let's get into this and, and see what's going on. The more I'm learning about this case, the more frustrating it's getting and the more why I'm understanding why you guys are are so hurt by all this. I mean, an eyewitness that's right behind the vehicle as this is going on, a potential for a camera like that. We know there's a functional business where that parking lot is. I don't know what their camera system is, but I'm assuming they might have something. There's a church across the street. A lot of times they might have a camera as well. It just seems like there's a lot of pieces of this that could have come into play and really snapped this together really easily. Is there some, you would, you would think so. Yeah. Is there some aspect of the suspect? Is this a figure that is like feared in that area? Is there a reason why neighbors don't want to name this guy or something along those lines? I mean, from the man that owns the garage, that's, that's the, I, one of the eyewitnesses, he was like, this guy, this was not his first rodeo. The way he did Lucas is like, he's like, I know this guy was not, this was not the first time for him. Yeah. Especially that, you know, so Lucas, they were going down, he was shot and then he jumped out. The guy had to keep going and kind of make like a weird turn. Um, and he did that and he parked his car and walked over to Lucas, like laying there, you know, um, I think Lucas was trying to make a phone call. I think or he might have called 911. The police have never been able to say for sure, for sure, if he did or not. 
Um, but that he just walked over and shot him two more times and then just walked away. Didn't run, didn't turn back, didn't nothing. So for me, that would, it, it does. I feel like the people in the neighborhood do know him. They know that that's what that guy's about. And I like it just a gun for hire, you know, I guess maybe mm-hmm. think so. Did the description of the car or the description of the people in the car, did that seem familiar to you at all? I mean, you've been, no. you've kind of been around. I know you went and picked him up from that one situation and, but the car didn't ring any bells for you or. No, I mean, when I, I would see him, I would pick him up or bring him to where he has to go. Um, I didn't see people's vehicles, you know, or anything like that, or that I would have known. I didn't like looking around. I didn't like knowing the things that he was doing. Some of the people that he associated with really scare me, scared me, still do, you know. So I wouldn't even really like try to look at people in their faces when I would bring him here or there. But no, the car definitely didn't seem familiar um i just yeah. do you have suspicions on who it might be i for sure think it was the guy from the hotel um that was dating the girl um that lucas was kind of messing around with so the girl that lucas was messing around with kind of here and there um had grown up with the boy, the guy that was in the car the, at the end at the hotel, the white guy. Um, so they grew up dating each other and being on drugs together. And at the end of the day, I that's what I really feel that this happened is because that guy couldn't handle Lucas. And I, you know, I'm sure Lucas was like, yeah, I got your girlfriend. You know, like that's how Lucas was. Yeah. So... I just feel like it, I want to say she, she is a true junkie and this, this guy is too. Um, and I could tell, I could see that from when I did pick Lucas up at that hotel. Um, I think he couldn't handle Lucas and him being like messed up in his mind or like, that's my girl or, you know, I think he's the one that put it all, set it all up. And that's really what it's about. I don't think it's over drugs or stolen money that Lucas got back from so-and-so or anything like that. I think just drug-induced stupidity. Yeah, yeah. Are you uh, aware of any, like we've talked about a lot of stuff that hasn't happened around this case. Have you heard of any things that have happened in terms of like forensic testing or evidence that they have collected? No. The only thing they have is uh, Lucas's cell phone, I believe still. Um, It took them a while to get into it. And then they were finally able to, but I don't, I don't know if they've ever done actually anything with it um yeah well they said that they dug into it a little bit and that they thought they found something from a few days before um but it turned out to be nothing and you know the first detective that was on the case said yeah come on you know you want to see because the story that he got and the story that i got from the girl from lucas's girlfriend or whatever um Mm -hmm. was that lucas was at a house he got a phone call said he'd be back in five minutes and he never came back that is totally something lucas would do but he always went back you know if he had he got a call he was going to do something he'd say i'll be back yeah and so she said oh i started calling him at five we had plans and he wasn't answering and you know, so that was the story the detective had got that I got. So it's like he got a phone call. That's the person that is responsible killed for him. this, you know, and they just say, no, that's there's we, not. We don't have anything. anything. Yeah. 
it t- I mean, and, forensically, it gets tough, you know, if there's not a lot of interaction during the violence, like where where is there going to be a print or where are they going to find, you know, <laughs> hopefully with a gun match or, you know, some type of ballistics uh, information, maybe they could do something along those lines. But uh, what, what were you going to say, Matthew? The, the thing that kills me about the situation is my brother may have been a lot of things, but a dummy he was not. Um, and Lucas probably would not be leaving somebody's house just to leave somebody's house or hotel or whatever, especially in certain areas, unless there was a reason to, unless he was contacted and unless he trusted the people that he was with. There's no way my brother being who he is and, and us being who we were, there's no way that he gets into a car with two unknown people mm-hmm. right right to trust them and especially to sit in the back seat where you are essentially completely vulnerable to everything because you can't see anything that's going on in, in the front or mm-hmm. anything else my personal belief is if there was actual digging done on that phone whether text messages or or anything else um pull phone records whatever the case may be I think there is quite a, quite a good opportunity to pull information that is essentially needed from that phone. I, I believe whoever was responsible for everything that happened that day at least contacted him one time, at least one time that day. Because, like I said, Lucas was a lot of things, but a dummy he was not, especially when it came to his safety and mm-hmm. everything else. Yeah. I don't know. It's just, it's, it's really heartbreaking. It, it seems pretty clear. Both of you think that this is part of a social circle. So you're right. You would think the phone would certainly play a key. If this is a situation where it was kind of a trap that was set, they had to bait that trap somehow. That's more likely going to happen through some type of communication on that phone as well. Um, yeah, it's, it's really tough. So I think, uh, I'm not even, I, I have a question here about how do you feel about law enforcement's efforts on this case, but it, it seems pretty clear. Um, we, we don't think enough has happened on this case. No. Uh, um, there's, there's a lot of pieces at play. We've, we've got someone essentially on the run at this point that it's at least considered a person of interest. Um, have you asked them, have they tried any efforts to track that guy down? Not that I'm aware of. I mean, um, I met with the first detective for six hours. The new detective on the case met with me and my in-laws for not even 40 minutes. Mm. Uh, There's, there, I don't know. They're not, I don't know. The guy from Crime Stoppers said to be careful what you say about law enforcement because it could be considered slander. Um, But they haven't reached out to anybody. (laughs) Matthew's in Germany. He's ready to talk, I guess. Um, I I have no issue slandering the Detroit PD. Well, you you had a tough into it. Yeah. You had a tough conversation with him just a few weeks ago, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I reached out to the new detective. I asked him if anything's been done. He was like, well, I I talked to your mother. I said, well, you need to talk to me. He said, well, I don't need to do that. Oh, and apparently there's been a uh, freedom of information um, request. A FOIA request done. So the last time I spoke to him, he wasn't able to continue anything with the case because of the uh, FOIA act. Um, but I don't know who, who pulled that. Yeah. Um, there's no press coverage on this. So no, it's, yeah. there's, there's none. So I don't understand who, who requested the FOIA. Um, well, and also wh- why that would stop know. him from talking doesn't make sense either. There's, I, yeah, it, it none of it makes sense. But he said it's under uh, FOIA investigation. He was no he he wasn't able to continue investigating until after the FOIA information was put out um, to whomever requested it. Uh, I like I said, I have no idea who it was. And then me and him got into it because I I said I don't believe you have done a single thing. Um, I know when my 
my mother and my sister-in-law were on their way to Detroit. You knew they were coming for a period of time prior to them getting there. And you still couldn't even have the consider consideration to open up his file, let alone know my sister-in-law's first name mm. and um, give her and my mother the common courtesy to be able to talk about the case in any sort of light or fashion and essentially just blow them off in, in an hour. And he, he came back with, well, you don't know what's going on with it. And, and you weren't there for the meeting. And, and that's not what happened. And I said, well, then tell me what, the, what happened. Tell me what happened and, and we can have a conversation. And he said, well, I'm not going to get into that with you because I don't know who you are. And you're calling from Germany. And I said, my name's it's our first class pile. I'm in the United States Army. I live in Germany. That's my little brother. I picked him up in freaking Detroit and I want to know information. He said, well, that's not enough for me. I said, okay. And then he told me to call him um, that following Monday. He said, call me at this time, Detroit time, and uh, me, you, and your mother will have a discussion. And I called him four times that the day that he told me to. Um, nice, cool, calm, collected, and not a single time did he pick up. So, have you uh did you check in with your mom last week how is she doing at this point i i checked in with everybody yeah that's what i do yeah i make sure people are good yeah well i'm, I'm glad you're there to do that because uh i can't imagine that how tough this is for hitting that one year mark and having all these frustrations in terms of the investigation and lack of media coverage and everything else it's there's this case has a lot of very very big challenges has anyone kind of taken up the role of trying to be like a pr person for this case trying to get some local coverage or an investigative reporter looking into it i mean i've gone through like facebook groups of trying to find a private investigator and it's hard to know who's legit and yeah. who's not and yeah. It's hard when you don't really know where to go, especially when law enforcement isn't doing anything. Then what's next? I just don't know where to go. You know, I want people to look into this case. I want people to find out what he was doing in that car, where he was at before he got in the car. You know, I want answers. I want people to say, hey, I've seen this kid, you know, the guy, the suspect, you know, alleged suspect. I want answers. My kids want answers. They deserve it. Lucas's family deserves it. Lucas deserves it. I don't know why there hasn't been more, and I don't know how to go about doing it. What about even some type of notice just about the guy that's on the run? It's like, hey, we've got a person of interest in this particular case. Um, he's skipped out on his parole. Like what? Just some type of basic, like a poster. Common decency. Yeah. Common courtesy. Yeah. Hey, we we had to let this go. This guy, this person of interest, go due to these circumstances, we'll continue to keep an eye out on him. Or, hey, by the way, we had to release him. We kept an eye on him for a little while, and then he disappeared, and we've no longer been able to, to locate him or yeah. the woman that was associated with him or anybody. And But no, I haven't seen any sort of common courtesy. You can't even get a phone call back. Um, from these people, let alone anything else. Um, I've suggested to my mother numerous times to reach out to the SBI, State Bureau of Investigations, mm -hmm. um, to see if they will open up some sort of a inquiry, because I, I believe that Detroit PD has dropped the ball in, in on numerous occasions for Lucas's case. Um, and I believe that somebody needs to hold somebody else's foot to the fire in order to get any sort of result. I mean, anything, a talk to the neighbor, talk to the woman that owns the house with the, with the camera. And I, I might accept that as, as actually doing something towards, towards helping out um, the family and, and the girls and, and Lucas and everybody else who, who just sits in, in shock and, and despair because we don't know what happened. And I understand 
that things happen all the time. It's, it's part of, it's my line of work, unfortunately at times, but there's always answers for the things that have happened. And there's just nothing, nothing anywhere, no answers, no, no, Hey, we'll, we'll keep you informed. We'll back brief you. We'll, we'll let you know. There's nothing like, unless you are hounding somebody, there's nobody that's reaching out and talking to you. I, it just astounds me. Yeah. 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 I can tell, I can tell that you're frustrated, exasperated. Um, it's just, it, and it blows my mind too. You've got, uh, you know, big media sometimes looks at very specific things for the stories that they publish. And you've got a mother with that that's heartbroken. You've got two daughters that are heartbroken. You've got an ex-wife trying to step up and find justice for this man. You got a brother serving our country. Uh, what other story elements, if that's what we're boiling down for major media to, to latch onto this, what else would they need? Like what, that's that's what's so frustrating about it. Where are all the articles that should be popping up about this? Um, and those articles, especially if they're local news sources, can be helpful because then all of a sudden, yeah, there's a little heat that's coming up under that department in particular. Hey, the local papers talking about us today. They're saying that we botched this thing. What's what's happening with this case? They're saying there's these simple steps that could have been taken. These, I mean, we've we've hit them. There's really two, three really big steps in terms of this investigation that either they're not looking into for some reason, or they're looking into and just not giving you any updates on, but it doesn't sound like that's the case. Um, it's, it's weird. Cause I have a question here of what's preventing this case from getting solved. And it's almost like the answer would be lack of interest is what it seems like. I don't know how else to categorize it. Um, I think that's correct. Well, we're trying to catch the attention of someone out there that knows something, and we're hoping that they'll be brave and strong enough to call in the tip that this family desperately needs. But outside of that, uh, how else can viewers help your efforts? And I just want to call out Matthew. I think your focus on the children with the GoFundMe, yep. very passionate, very smart. And uh, of course, we're supporting that and asking other people to look into that. We'll have the link in the description box down below. Is there anywhere else where people can follow you guys on your efforts on social media or help show support in some way? So I'm I'm pretty, I, I don't post much on social media nowadays. Um, the GoFundMe that I created was because Lucas really didn't have any assets to leave the girls, um, was a effort in order to raise money um, for the girls for college or whatever they they need, depending on, on the route in life in which they take. Um, I've got the money set aside in, in an account where they can't touch it. Um, and when the time comes, we split the money, give it to each of the girls and and they go forward and, and do their things. But I don't have any platforms right now that I really am on in order to to get the the word out. I guess yeah. you could say I, I keep a pretty low profile, more or less. Yeah. Uh, Megan, is there any plans? Can we get a Facebook page started on this? I know you were talking about groups you had kind of checked into, but so I mean, if you want to get a Facebook group going, that would be awesome. I'm not tech savvy. Um, my daughter is the one who turned Lucas's Facebook page into like a tribute page kind of thing, so yeah. she did that. Yeah, I don't know. You know, I'm not tech savvy, like I just said. I have Instagram and I have Facebook. I tried to post the Crime Stoppers from YouTube to Instagram. I don't know how to, I couldn't figure it out. I, maybe they, I, somebody told me they don't let YouTube doesn't let you share to Instagram, which I didn't know. Um, okay. And I, honestly, I don't know a lot of people. So, I mean, yeah. Lucas, I, I, you know, I know all of his friends. He's got thousands of them, but you know, I, I, we need, we need a home base just for the information online. Now that there's something, I mean, now we've got, 
we've got the Crime Stoppers video. We've got this video. We've we've got to start. Uh, we've got the GoFundMe that's running. So we've got the pieces. Uh, I'll tell you guys what I'm gonna do. I have um, a lot of close supporters and friends of the channel here, and uh, I'm gonna find the person to help put that page together. We're gonna go ahead and get that page put together for you guys and start publicizing that as well. And um, hopefully, once again, we're just trying to get this video, get this information in, in front of the right person and ask them to do the right thing. So uh, yeah, we'll get that rolling for you guys. Um, well, a big thank you to both of you. Is there anything that you wanted to say uh, before we ended here? And um, I just wanna say thank you for, for trusting me and for uh, coming on and sharing all this with us. But is there anything else you wanted to say before we ended? Just, I just want people to do their job. Like, I don't know. If I don't do my job, people die. People aren't doing their job and people are dying. I just want somebody to be held accountable for the things that they are or are not doing. I want some sort of information, something, something to, to come to fruition. One, one piece of the puzzle is all you typically need in order for other pieces to fall into place. Just need that base corner as a building block. And I just want there to be a base corner in order to build off of. I just, I want the people responsible to be handed, you know, consequences. And at the end of the day, once that happens, once they get the people that did this, after that, I just want the police to apologize to Lucas, like Detroit, the whole department to apologize to Lucas and to my my children because they have everything. You said it, you know, they have everything. They have his phone. They have eyewitness. They have, you know, footage. They have, you know, they have everything that they need to, you know, solve this. And it should have been, you know, I just, that's, that's what I'm hoping for. The, and, and at the end of the day, for them to say, you know, we messed up, we dropped the ball. I'm admitting it. That's 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 it. Well, I hope in the tough moments for both of you and for Marley and Macy that you guys find some of those warm memories and good times with Lucas and uh, have those be a little beacon of light to help you through some of the dark stuff around this. And uh, please let the girls know that, um, you know, there's several thousand of us out here now that know Lucas's story and uh, care about That's it. That's awesome. Yeah. And, and we're looking to help. So, all right. Thank you guys so much. If you have information, Crime Stoppers of Michigan is where you want to send it. Here is a post they have. Of course, we have links to everything in the description box down below. If you have any information, we're asking that you make an anonymous call to Crime Stoppers at 1 800 Speak Up or visit our website at www.1800speakup.org. Your identity will remain anonymous. No one will take your name or contact information. Instead, you get a number, a random number assigned. If your tip helped lead the investigations to capture and arrest, you'll be instructed on how to anonymously receive your cash. Once again, big word, cash reward. Nothing traceable going on with this. Also, we touched on it briefly earlier in the video. There is a GoFundMe that is running currently on this case. We can see they were trying to get to a $10,000 goal to help Lucas's daughters. They're at 5515 On behalf of myself and my amazing supporters through PayPal, Patreon, coffee, merchandise, thank you guys so much. We're making a donation together to this GoFundMe, and I'll have a link to it down below if you want to help us increase that by making your own donation as well. Thank you so much for spending some time learning about this case. It's just, it's a case that no one knows about, and now you're one of the special people that do. The question is, can you take that next step 
and help spread that awareness with me. So I really appreciate you taking this time. Before I end today's video, I want to thank some new patrons. A big thank you to Ellie B, Ann Woodworth, and Karen Sheets. On top of that, a big thank you to Emily Nichols and Stephanie Joyner for increasing their pledges. Remember, if you want to support the channel, please visit lordandarts.com where you can sign up for Patreon, sign up for PayPal, buy merchandise, or buy us a coffee like Sooner History recently did. We really need your help as we continue trying to help these families in these terrible situations. We just can't do it without your support. So we're so thankful to those of you that take that extra step and have our backs, essentially. Take care, everyone. Have a nice weekend. Hug your kids a little extra hard this weekend in honor of Lucas. And I'll see you again on Monday with a brand new episode of Case Cracked right here on the Lord and Arts Channel.